Hey, good morning, guys. Hey, welcome to episode two. This is episode two of the drawing board. Come on, if you was with us on last Monday, I want to tell you, hey, go back after you after you hear this, please go back to episode one just to get the brief. I called it the building blocks. It's the foundation. As you guys know, we kicked off last week talking about spiritual disciplines. Come on, we we talked about, hey, it's time to get back in the gym. And, 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 and anybody with me this morning, it's it's time to get back in the gym. And and if you missed episode one, here's what we mean by that. Here's what we mean by, by that. And I'm going to read it from 1 Timothy chapter 4. I love this scripture. And this is kind of our building block scripture for the next six weeks. Here's what we're committing to, family. Here's the agreement that we're having with one another. Come on, you, you guys want to keep each other ones accountable. We're saying, hey, we're going back to, to the gym to make sure that we get closer to God, to make sure that we get better in this season, to make sure that we get stronger in this season. The only way to do that, hear my heart on this family, the only way to do that is, is by creating spiritual disciplines in our life. We talked a lot about um, last Monday about, about being consistent and creating healthy disciplines. When we do that, here's what that, here, here's the equation. It leads to success. What is success? Having a healthy relationship in our life, having a healthy relationship with our Lord and Savior. So it says this in 1 Timothy, stay clear of silly stories that get dressed up as religion. I'm, I'm reading it from the message translation. And then I love this part. It says, exercise daily in God. No spiritual flabbiness, please. <laughs> where do you, I, when I read it, I look at my life, man, where do I have some spiritual flabbiness in my life? May, maybe it's in my prayer life. Maybe it's in my scripture engagement. H how's my worship life? Is it, is, it, is it spiritual fit or is it flabby? <laughs> it doesn't need, doesn't need some work. And I love where Paul says this. He said, workouts and the gymnasium are useful. But then he goes on, he said, but a disciplined life, hear that family, but a disciplined life in God is far more so. Let us not value other things in our life more than we value our relationship with our Lord and Savior. We, in this season, we want to be spiritual fit in this season. So the, the first exercise, come on, we, we getting ready to go in the gym, hopefully, you stretch this morning. Come on. I already, I already told you, I'm, I'm going to be your, your spiritual fit trainer. Is that okay? Can I, can, can I, for the next six weeks, can I be your spiritual fit trainer? We're going back to the gym to get stronger, to get better, and to get closer with God. And, and our first one I want, I want to tackle this morning, family. I want to tackle prayer. Come on. The, the, the Bible says to, to, to never cease from that. Never cease from prayer. I love this quote. And I quote right now, and it says, I love this quote. It says, nothing of eternal value is ever accomplished apart from prayer. Anything that God is calling you to do in this season, I, I want to speak about this season. I don't want to speak about the future. I don't want to speak about six, 12, a, a half a year, what God is getting ready. Let's talk about the now. Let's maximize the now moment. God is looking to do, to do some big things in your now season. Yes, God is going to do some amazing things six months down the road. But the beauty of who he is and what he has in store for you right now. In this season, for you, your family, your friends, your community, this church, what God wants to do right now in order, hit his family, in order to, 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 to reveal and, and see what God is getting ready to do, we have to create a, 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 a lifestyle in our life to be in commune with God on a, on a consistent level. When, 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 even when I look at that word prayer, I, I love even when you begin to study prayer and even when you begin to go back into the Greek or maybe the Hebrew. And I, I actually love it in the Greek when you, when, when you study it and it's, it's early in the morning. So let me let me get my let me get my Greek vocal cords ready. But I, I love this word um, and it talks a lot about agreement and it, it means this. It means some for nail. Say that with me. Yeah, that, 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 that's a lot. Some for Neo, 
That's a lot in the morning. Cause because when we look at when we look at agreement, I love the scripture in Matthews, and we all know this scripture. If two of you agree on earth, if two of you agree on earth, see when we look at when we break that word down, sun, S-U-N, it, it, it means actually together. It's a compound word here that, that's connecting back to prayer and, and agreement. And, and, and the first word of his son, it means together, S-U-N, together. And then his son, phone, phone. We know what phone is. Phone is a sound. It is a sound. It is a sound literally meaning. So when we put those two together, son, S-U-N, meaning together, phoneo, phone, meaning sound, agreement, with a sound that's coming together. This is what prayer is in your life. Can we begin to look, to look at prayer as that, that we're making a sound to heaven that brings us in agreement for what heaven is getting ready to do? When I look at prayer, I, I, I see a sound. So even when we study it more, this is where we get symphony from. Come on, you know you, know you guys, you go to, if you're here in the DC, the Kennedy Center, come on. This is where we get that, that Greek word from symphony. It's a it's an agreement of a sound that's being released in earth that's connecting to heaven. Or heaven is waiting for earth to agree so that heaven can release what's in heaven down to earth. God wants to use you as a vessel. Hear that today. That God wants to use you as a vessel. It's the beautiful thing, even when you go to an orchestra and, and the director begins to, he's doing this thing. I wanted to be that guy when I was in elementary. I, I just love that guy. He's just in charge and he's directing them and everybody's looking at him and everybody stands up and I don't know what he's doing. I just know he does this <laughs> and they play in a beautiful song and, and one section begins to play and then the other section begins to play. And in order, hear this, in order to be connected to the director and be on the same sound as each and every one that's a part of the team, they have to stay focused to the director. When the director wants them to go up, they got to be able to go up. When the director wants them to begin, begin to shift, they have to begin to shift. If they don't stay focused to that director, that's going to be a horrible sound. But when they are all on agreement with who? The director. When they're on a, one accord with the, dire the director, this is what I love about Acts. It says that they were all in one place. Come on, fam. They were all in one place and one sound went, one, one sound went forth. Why? Because who was they connected to? They were connected. The Holy Spirit was coming. They were connected to the source. So now a beautiful sound was getting ready to go forth. This is what prayer is in our life. It's us releasing a beautiful sound to heaven. It is impossible for you to play a beautiful melody to God, not being connected to the source. So we stay in prayer and our best example of what prayer is in your life, come on somebody, it's not a pop quiz, come on, we know Jesus is the greatest example of what prayer is in our life. You guys remember back in the 90s? Come on, anybody remember this? I'm taking you back, I know. You remember the WWJ statement? Come on, come on. If you just, just put it in the chat, if you was that person that used to wear the bracelet, what, what would Jesus do? Come on, you had the bracelet, you had the necklace. If that was you, just go ahead and, and put it in the chat. But when I was thinking about this even last night, about WWJ, what would Jesus do? To be honest, I think a better question is for assessment, it really is WDJD. What did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? Jesus did uh, some amazing things in his public ministry. We, we all know, we, we read the gospel, we see the amazing things that Jesus did. In order for Jesus to do these amazing things, he had a great private life. In order to do amazing things in public, there were some things that Jesus took care of in his private. And Jesus always found time, hear this family, he always found time to participate in the most important thing that connected him back to his father. He, he didn't allow the noise or the distraction or even the assignment, hear that family. 
He did not allow the noise from the people, the distracting of the multitude, or even the assignment that he was actually brought on earth to do. It did not pull him away from his private time that he had to spend with the Father. Here's why I'm saying that if Jesus could find time to get along and spend time with the Father, I, I believe we can do the same thing. Nobody is carrying a weight that Jesus is carrying, and Jesus still found time to, to, to get away and spend time with the Father because what he did in his private actually elevate what he was getting ready to do in the public. And if you're looking for God to elevate you to do some things in the public, my question to you today, how's your private time with Jesus looking like? Here's that self self-assessment as we're getting back in the gym. Come on, it's time to get fit, spiritual fit. And I love this by Dr. Tony Evans. He's an author, he's a, a pastor. I love his definition of prayer. His definition of prayer is this. It says, a believer's oral or mental communication with God the Father through the authority of Jesus Christ with the assistance of the Holy Spirit. I know that's, that, that's a lot. I, I, I want to unpack it a little bit because he says a believer. He says a believer, hear that, a believer. In order to get the results and commune with your father, you have first got to believe in your prayers and believe in your God and believe for the thing that you're praying. Your prayers are centered on the foundation of a belief. I believe in my father. I believe that he can do this. Even when doubt begins to sense in, I still want to find my place moving from a place of belief. You are a believer. This is what Dr. Tony Evans is saying. It starts from a relationship of being a believer. But then he goes, and I, I love this definition because he says a mental communication with God the Father. We are praying to our Father. He is Abba. Come on, somebody. He is your father. In other words, here's what I'm saying. It, this is all about relationship. This is all about relation. Who is your father? He is Jehovah Jireh in your life. He is your provider. We pray to God because life and world cannot do what my father can do. Life and world can't even give me what my father wants to give me. His, his word says that joy in the world cannot give this. It doesn't have the potential to fulfill you for what you need in your life. That can only come from who? Your father. When Jesus was praying, he always found time to go back to the father because even Jesus knew himself. This assignment that I'm getting ready to do, I can't do this without my father. The assignment that's in your life for this season, hear my heart. This season, you cannot do it without your father. He's Jehovah Java, we pray to the Father. But then he goes and he says, through the authority of Jesus Christ. Understanding this, that the authority relies and sits with Jesus. This is why we pray in Jesus' name. I love it in John 14. It says, whatever you ask in my name, I would do it so that the Father may be glorified. If you ask me anything, in my name, I will do it. That is, that's John 14, 13, and 14. Jesus saying, in my name, the authority relies in Jesus Christ. The authority, he's the one, he's the, 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 the sacrifice lamb that's, that's set on the altar. The authority relies in him. So here it is, when you're praying, this is why we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Not my name, not your name, not, not, not another name, but the name of Jesus Christ. Whatever you're going through in this season right now, remember that, that, that Jesus covers that. He's overpowering that. Even things to the thing are called death and anything underneath that. Jesus' name is greater than that. This is why we say we plead the blood of Jesus. Why? Because his blood still reigns. His blood is still covering. His blood is still moving. There's nothing more powerful or even the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. His name does not lose no value. His name does not dep dep depreciate. His name remains the same, and his name, is, his name still has that 
authority. And then he says, with the assistance of the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. We'll, we'll, we'll be celebrating our Pentecost Sunday. Come on. And, and that, this is what we believe. We pray to the Father. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. But let's not leave out the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is here to assist us in our prayer life. Even I love it in Romans 8, 26, it says this, in the same way that the Spirit also help us in our weakness, because we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit, hear that family, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with expressible groanings. Even when I don't know what to say, the Holy Spirit is here to help me stay connected to my Father. Even when I don't have the words to say, the Holy Spirit is my interpretation interpreter. It begins to translate it to the heavenly language so that heaven can understand what I'm going through. When you don't have the words, when you don't have the understanding, when you're in a relationship, the Holy Spirit, I want you to hear that today. Maybe you're struggling in your prayer life. You know, I don't know what to say. You know, I'm looking at other people. They pray so well. They pray so eloquent. They vocabulary. I mean, it's just heaven. Matter of fact, come on, Pastor Brenda can pray, family. Pastor Brenda, I'm telling you, when, when Pastor Brenda prays, I know heaven is listening. I know. I'm like, demons, you got to go. Something about to happen. That woman of God just pray fire. I mean, whoosh, fire down. I can't pray like Pastor Brenda. That does not diminish your prayer life. You are special in the way that you pray. I have three sons. They're all the same and they're all different at the same time. They're unique, their communication, their vocabulary, the way that they connect with me. One connects one way, another connects that way. And I love them in each and every way that they connect to me. That's the love of a father. You don't have to try to replicate anybody else to get closer to God. God has created you in a special way how he wants you to communicate and commune with him on a daily basis. God is waiting to have a, 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 a God is waiting to have a healthy dialogue with you. That's it. <clears throat> a healthy dialogue. And here's what I mean by that: a constant conversation. Man, come on. And anybody, I'll say it this way as we get ready to, to move along. I'll say it this way: if you're in a healthy relationship, there's always constant dialogue, right? Come on, me, me and Brenda, we'll be celebrating 17 years. I think I got that right. 17 years in November of marriage. It's no way I, I will have a healthy relationship if I don't put her as a priority in my life to communicate and have healthy dialogue in my life. It, it's no way that I say, hey, babe, um, for this week, um, I'm busy. I'm going to just get back to you next week and I'll try to catch back up. No. I'll be sleeping with one eye open. Come on, family. I show up on Sunday. I'm telling you, it ain't going to happen in the Vaughn's house. So you're not going to just talk to me for a week go by and you're not talking because you, you're too busy. No, she's a top priority in my life. You value the thing. Whatever you value in your life, you make time for. Whatever you value in life, you will make time for. Here's that getting back into the gym. This is a non-negotiable. I have to spend time with God. That's a non-negotiable in your life, creating space for God to be God in your life, creating these routines. Here's why we have to do that. Because prayer changes your outlook. Prayer begins to change your perspective on things that's happening in your life. In order to change our perspective, we need to change our altitude. Prayer gives us a different vantage point vantage point on things that we're looking at in this season of our life. See, see, this is what I love about, we, we see from the, we see how Jesus always withdrew from the crowd to go spend time with, with, with his father. And in order to get a different vantage point, even Jesus had to withdraw. He had to get away from the crowd and just spend time with the father. In Luke 5, 15, it says this, 
But the news about him spread even more in large crowds. Hear that? Large crowds. We all have large crowds in our life. You can have a large crowd, something that distracting you, the busyness, whatever it may be. It says large crowds will come together to hear him and to be healed of their sickness. Verse 16, yet he often withdrew to deserted places and prayed. Large crowds, yet he still got away to pray. It says this in Mark 135, very early in the morning. Come on, somebody. While it was still dark, he got up, went out, and made his way to a deserted place, and there he was praying. Jesus understood that prayer was essential for him. He knew he had to withdraw in order to stay close to the Father. This is the beautiful thing about prayer. So when, I, when I'm asking a question about getting back into the gym, how are you withdrawing from the noise in your life and spending time with your Father? One, one of the resources, uh, we talk a little bit about this in our next step um, our next step class here at um, Celebration Church. I love the one minute pause app. You can download, take, take that down and, and that, that's free right there. That might, was a free app too, but download the one minute pause app. Here's what I love about the one minute pause app. I set reminders in, in the app and here's what it does. It reminds me to pause and pray. One minute, that's it. Of course, you can go longer. If you, you, it's not being legalistic. You can go longer. But throughout my day, I just need reminders to pause and put my mind back on the director. Why? Because I have to make sure I'm, I'm making a, a heavenly sound to heaven throughout my day. I, I, I don't want to make a. I don't. I don't want to make a sound like God is like. Who? Where's that coming from? Who's playing that sound? That's. That, he, he just off track right now. I, that, that's not the sound that Anthony's supposed to be making today. Come on, there's things that go through in my life. My attitude can get off. I'm not in agreement with this or this is going on. That didn't go. Like we all have different things that can get us off track of what God wants to, to do. We have to learn how to create a healthy rhythm in our life to pause, reflect, and say, okay, God, let me put my mind back on you. Before I make any major decision, let me pause and put my mind on you. Let me invite you into the space. Because here's why. Creating space for God to be God in your life. Stop creating space. And I'm speaking to myself right here. Stop creating space for you to try to be a God in your life. But rather create space for God to be God in your life. How do we do that? We do that through communing, communion with God and creating and pausing and reflecting and say, hey, God, I'm putting my mind back on you in this season. That's how we get spiritual fit in this season. So we said prayer changes our outlook. It begins, it begins to see. So now the vantage point, when Jesus used to withdraw, he used to go up to the mountain and, and spend time with God and with his, with, with his father, his vantage point was changed. He once had a level eye view of what was going on, but then he used to go away to spend time and sometimes he went to the mountain. Now he has a bird's eye view, or can I say it like this? He has a eagle's eye view of the situation of what he's going through right now. That's the beauty of prayer family, is that it takes us from ground level and it brings us up to a bird's level. So now we're able to see the bigger picture the things that we could not see that God was doing in the in it being in the midst of it, now we have a bigger, we have the, the stroke of a bigger picture in our life and what God is doing in our life. Now we can see that God is actually over here moving. Now we can hear that God is over here doing some things. Prayer gets us in alignment with the director so that we can make a beautiful sound, but hearing that beautiful sound leads to transformation, family. The beautiful sound leads from transformation. And the last one, I, I, I want to say this, prayer. Here it is. Here's why prayer is so important. Prayer brings dead things back to life. Prayer. It brings dead things back to life. Here's what I mean by that. We know the scripture in John 11, uh, 41 through 44. And this is, this, is the, this is the story about Jesus and Lazarus. 
And we know that Jesus came on the scene late and, and then he begins to, to raise Lazarus from the dead. He calls him out of the tomb. And, and when we look at this scripture, Lazarus can be a metaphor to us of a dead thing. Maybe it, it, it can represent, you know, maybe a dead relationship. It, it, it can represent maybe a dead dream. You know, in, in my life, I did some, some dreams that I used to have that kind of kind of washed away because of time and life. And, and God is saying, no, I can speak to that thing right now. So maybe the relationship, dead dream, maybe, maybe a dead career. You know, you went to school for this and things are not panning out. Maybe you just feel like you're in a dead end of something in this season. Here's what prayer can do. Prayer can begin to call and speak to a dead thing in your life. When we pray, we tap into the resurrection power of our Lord and Savior. That doesn't matter what may be dead in our life, prayer can speak to that thing. And here's the beauty of when I, what I love about this scripture, and when you read it through, just for time's sake, I'm not, I'm not going to read all of it, but I'm just going to um, just kind of summarize it, is that when Jesus arrives on the scene, before Jesus even speaks to the, 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 the stone, excuse me, the stone, before Jesus speaks to Lazarus, who does Jesus speak to first? He begins to pray to who? The Father. In your life right now, here's what, here's what God is saying. Stop speaking to the stone and start speaking to me. Jesus shows up on the scene. He's not having a conversation with the people. He's not having a conversation with the stone. Jesus says this, that Jesus begins, he lifts up his eyes and he says, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd standing here, I said this so that they may believe you sent me. Jesus shows up on the scene and he begins to talk to the father. Before you talk to the dead thing, begin talking to the father about the dead thing. Come on, somebody. Don't spend time just talking to the stone out of your own strength, out of your own wisdom, out of your own connection of what you think you can do. But when you commune to the father, the father would take care of the stone. I just want to spend time with the father. And what I love about this, oh, man, I'm, I, this is not even part of my notes. But here's the beautiful thing. It says this in, in, in verse 43. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice. In other words, he said, after he said this, it wasn't as if Jesus was just praying under his breath. Oh, my gosh. It, it wasn't as Jesus was just having a silent moment. Come on, you know, you can have your quiet, silent moment. I, I love having my quiet, silent moment with, with, with my father. But in the midst of the, in the midst of the distraction, in the midst of the opposition, in the midst of the unbelief or the doubt, here it is. Jesus begins to elevate his voice so that not just he will hear it, oh my gosh, that the others around him will hear it. When it comes to prayer, there are times for us to be silent prayer. I believe in that. But I also believe in your quiet time, there's are times where you actually have to elevate yourself to a level where you actually hear yourself praying. Begin to exercise that in your life, praying out loud, so that your voice begins to change the atmosphere that you're sitting in. Come on, somebody. Begin to release your heavenly voice. This is going back to what we were talking about earlier. You are part of the symphony. You are part, there's an instrument in your hand and you are part of the, the, the orchestra team in the back over here and they are waiting for you to take your rightful place, but you've been playing your instrument in silent mode. And God is saying in this season, come on somebody, in this season, it is time to take the silent mode off and it is time to elevate your pitch, elevate your vocal, elevate so that not only other people around you, but also yourself, hearing yourself pray out loud begins to raise your confidence. Hearing yourself praying out loud begins to raise, you know what, God, you are with me. 
There's a difference. I, I, I just watched when the scriptures say that Jesus prayed quiet, and then there was times when Jesus prayed out loud. I just don't think that's by just coincidence. I, I believe in every ink that's in the Bible, there's a reason behind it. Jesus would not only, he was showing the people around here, here's what, here's what God is getting ready to do. I love this. Uh, write this down. The journey to in intimacy happens on a road called prayer. I'm going to say that one more time. The journey to intimacy, hear that, happens on a road called prayer. If you're looking for a more intimate life with Christ, it happens on a road called prayer. This is the commun being, uh, communing with God. Here's why. Prayer makes us stronger. Prayer brings us closer, and prayer teaches us better. It teaches us. It begins to change our posture in life. When you're in the gym working out, come on, family, we're we in the gym this morning. If you're watching on Wednesdays, we are in the gym. In order to get stronger in the gym, everything begins with your posture. It begins with your core. We... We are getting stronger in this season because we're working on our core. Our posture is changing. So when our posture changes, things in our life get stronger. Things in our life get better. And our Holy Spirit in this season is teaching us a different posture. As I get ready to close out, I want to close out with, with this because I, 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 I was reading this um, this morning. Uh, and we all know the Lord's Prayer. I, I love, we all know the Lord's Prayer. And the fascinating thing about the Lord's Prayer when I was reading it, and I kind of just had this revelation this morning as the disciples, they asked Jesus a simple question. They said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Here's the fascinating thing about it, and to be honest, I really never even looked at it in, at, at this vantage point because these were Jewish men at least to the minimal fact they grew up around a custom of prayer. They're Jewish. It's part of their custom. So it's not as if they were never exposed to prayer in their life. They just never been exposed to Jesus in their life. They grew up around prayer, but they asked Jesus a simple question. Teach us how to pray. After they saw Jesus pray, gentlemen, sons, turning them in, grew up around prayer, but in this season, in this space, they were exposed to something greater in their life. When you get connected and exposed to Jesus, he always increases your appetite for more. It was something that they had in their life, but they were never exposed to that degree. And when they came in connection with Jesus, their appetite increased and they wanted more. Maybe you're in a season right now where you want more. And here's what I'm saying. His scripture says, those who thirst and hunger at the righteousness will be filled. If you're hungry, here's why you're hungry, because your, your soul wants more of Jesus. So this is why I'm saying, let's make sure we're staying in the posture of being fed by the Holy Spirit, because your soul needs it, and your soul understands it, because there's some assignments that you need to go do, and only to go do it, you have to learn how to make space in your life for God. You are hungry because you're being exposed to Jesus. Feed your spirit on every day. Feed your spirit, man, on every day. And as I get ready to close out, I, I want to give you some reflection uh, assessments, I like to call it. I like to call it, and here's, here's the first one. Simple question. How often do I pray? You, you, you have to simply ask, your, you have to ask yourself that question. How often do I pray? When do I pray? How often do I pray? When do I pray? The reason why I'm asking you this, because this needs to be at the best time you, and, and let me say that, let me say that better. It has to be when you're at your best. Don't, don't pick a time when you're not at your best. 
Give God your best. If you're a morning person, I, I mean, I simply do believe in making sure you give God your first, regardless if you're a morning person or not. Start your day with God. We talked about that in, in the first episode. But hey, community and getting a, a consistent rhythm with God, if you're a morning person, great. If you're not a morning person and that's not your best time, hey, give God your best time. When are you at your best? And now say, you know what, God, I'm going to stay committed to that. If it's the morning, great. If it's the evening, great. If it's the nighttime, great. Only you and God will know and God will challenge you in that area where only where I'm challenging all of us is to, hey, stay consistent with it. Give God your best. And, and the last one, the last one, because as we look at the example of Jesus, Jesus didn't pray because of, of, of guilty pleasure, but rather he prayed because of spiritual necessity. So, so in other words, is prayer like a, a chore for you or you understand it is a necessity in your life? Creating that rhythm out of necessity always leads to something great. Amen? Amen. So, family, hey, in this, this is our first exercise. Hey, you know what? I'm looking to get spiritual fit in this season. Holy Spirit, it's time to get back in the gym. Let, let, let me pray for you. Father God, we love you. We honor you. That even in this season right now, we, we hope and get a clear understanding of the beauty of prayer. I pray that our love for you is even rekindled in this season, that the Holy Spirit is beginning to, to stir up our appetite, that we're not, we're not simply praying for results, but we're praying to commune with you, Father, that we simply love you, we adore you, we understand that we're, we're nothing without you, that even as we would kick off our week or even for the the individuals who's watching this on Wednesday, in this season, in our now season, let us commune with you like never before. Set our hearts on fire. Set our minds to think about you. Our focus is so sharp in this season. We're falling deeply in love with you. Let our appetites grow deep. Hunger, thirst, let us run after you in this season. We love you so much. We honor you. It is in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.